flicker. I have been given the awesome task of concluding this TEDx, and uh, so I figured I would take it out as audaciously as I possibly could and talk about how poetry and meditation can save the world. <laughs> I'd like to start by reading you a poem that I wrote uh, from a painting, this painting that was at a women's art exhibit at the um, Oliver Art Center in Frankfurt. Several of us uh, were asked to write poems to respond to some of the paintings. This was my favorite painting. I, I just love those. Those are swallows, and it's called Swallow's Game. I don't know if you can read that. Here's the poem that I wrote. It's called Birdhouse. Remember the year we had bird, bluebirds there? How they came back the next year, poked their noses in and changed their minds? After that, it was all swallows. After we knew to clean out the twigs to get the house ready for renters, swallows, or wrens. Oh, they might have been wrens sometimes. They might have been wrens all along, but I like the word swallow. I think they were swallows, that tiny slender trilling down the scale. Wrens sound like their bodies, compact and insistent. It was good to have either. And their chicks, especially their chicks, evident only by the to and fro of the mothers, their fierce judgments. It was good to have that life greet us at the corner of the house. Bluebirds, we felt blessed. They let us know who was in charge, blast, blast, chitter, and the color, the royal robes. But the swallows, the way they swooped in and out, who doesn't love the word swoop? When they were crossing to the trees beyond our drive, remember how we'd sit in our kitchen chairs by the glass doors? It was so peaceful to watch that industry, that tiny hope carrying on, not caring a whit about us. Now I'm gonna make the absurd claim that a poem such as this one can save the world, and I'm gonna connect this to the practice of Buddhist-type meditation. First of all, I'd like us to look closely at the poem now that we've heard it. What does it do? It calls us, as the poet W.S. Merwin says in his own poem, to the things of this world. It pays close attention. It could have been about trash bags or sneezes or making love or anything else to do that, but in this instance, it's birds. Well, it's not about birds, is it? It's about the speaker. It's about her relationship with her husband, about a memory of a peaceful moment. Well, it's not about that either. It's about stalling, staying in the moment of sounds. The word swooped, the sound of birds, it holds us still. The line endings hold us too. They encourage us not to rush from one point A to point B. We are asked to turn a corner before the end of the sentence to make a brief pause before hurrying on. Each line is its own event. It's set up to be, let each line be its own event. And also the color, the royal robes, but the swallows. The thought isn't finished, but its unfinished quality gives us a whole other way to think. We were on bluebirds, but then the line is overtaken by swallows. We know we're about to turn the corner and find out what about swallows, but we're left momentarily held. It's the holding that I want to talk about. We're held with an image, royal robes. It may not be that image of royal robes, but it becomes a kind of vision. It calls for completion. A king or queen flickers in the corner of our eye. The bird and that flicker simultaneously collide in our minds, unlike things. Our minds cannot completely put them together. Our minds also have to cope with the disruption of an unfinished line. We long to complete the meaning. For a moment, we're held in midair. Is there going to be the meaning we expect, or is there going to be another one? Jane Hirschfield, a, poem, a, a poet I much admire, says that art by its very existence undoes the idea that there can be only one description of the real, 
some single and simple truth on whose surface we may thoughtlessly walk. You see where I'm going with this? A poem disrupts us. It will not allow us to move without thinking from point A to point B. It makes us stand in its small moments of silence and unknowing. The political ads, political TV shows are coming on thick and fast. I tried to avoid an image that would be specifically political one direction or another, but each one is absolutely confident of its truth and of the untruth of the other. They are slickly crafted. They are not appealing to our ability to reason. They could care less about our reason, although they would seem to do, they would seem that they do. They're instead slipping beneath the surface into our unconscious fears, our desires for security, for love, for community. They know where we live. We will not thwart them or turn them away by using reason. We will not save ourselves, apparently, by using reason, because the work of the ad is the work of a poem, to talk to us on a level there are no words for, in the space of silence and unreason. The difference between a political ad and a poem is that the poem is, and a poem is that the ad is prying open the space of our fears and immediately capping it over with a so-called solution a so-called perfect candidate who will save us. The poem opens us up and leaves us open, gasping, awestruck at the space we didn't realize was there. Some people are afraid of poems, and they should be. Osip Mandelstam, for one, died in a concentration camp in Siberia for writing poems that didn't cap over the spaciousness of the mind with the party line at the time. We stand in front of an art installation. I don't understand it, we might say. But what if someone said that we would understand it if, I were to if we were told that we were no longer awake, that it was a dream? It's not only political poems and art installations that are dangerous. It's the small, humble poems with birds like mine it's the small, humble poems with birds, like mine also. They train the mind to see their own spaciousness, its own spaciousness. They teach it not to grab for cliches. They teach it to trust uncertainty, to be willing to dwell there. So what does this have to do with morality and saving the world? You may be able to see where I'm going with this. I want a quote from a review of Brenda Hillman's new book in the American Poetry Review. The review is by Melissa Kwanzi. She begins by quoting a line from Hillman's title poem, it is nearly impossible to think about leading a moral life. Kwasny goes on to say, it feels so especially now, particularly if one is an American. Given the enormity of our position, our responsibility for war, for recent tortures, for the gulf filling with oil, the rapid extinction of species, the double meaning of the phrase, it is nearly impossible to think about, hits home. We not only can't think about it because the situation is cause for shame and despair, we can't rely on only thinking as a way out of it. It won't work. So what will? In another poem, Brimda Hillman writes, an ethics occurs at the edge of what we know. But then she writes, the creek goes underground from here. We cannot see directly the subterranean force that connects us all, that we all depend on. That makes, that makes us uncomfortable, sensing what we can't see. We would rather slap a cap over that. How to live the moral life, Brenda Hillman's poem says, you should make yourself uncomfortable, if not you, who? If we're uncomfortable, we're seeing directly that our comfort is built upon other people's discomfort. So if we're not made uncomfortable, who will be? Who will see what is happening to the water, the earthworm, the fly, if we don't? I'm sick of irony, Hillman says in another poem. Everything feels everything. It's the ability to feel that's the issue, to be able to counter the slick political surfaces of unfeeling of our egos, it is necessary to relearn to feel. Feeling is not done with the rational mind. 
The mind only slaps labels on our feelings, calls them sorrow or joy or anger to feel that it has control of them. Then the mind begins playing around with those words, finding causes and results, rationalizations and so on. Feeling has no words and no excuses and no explanations. It simply is what it is. Here's a poem from the great and recently deceased poem, a poet Lucille Clifton's Kent State poems. These were her response to the shooting of the students who were protesting the Vietnam War at Kent State University. Here's her poem. Surely I am able to write poems celebrating grass and how the blue in the sky can flow green or red and the waters lean against the Chesapeake shore like a familiar. Poems about nature and landscape, surely. But whenever I begin, the trees wave their knotted branches and why is there under that poem always an other one? There's always another voice under our voice calling. Perhaps that's why poetry seems intrinsically and eminently capable of doing this work of making the boundaries of the self unstable. Whether the voice that answers speaks out of its own life or that of others who are connected to it, in this case, the dead. What is the poet's responsibility toward the political? We have a mission. The mission is not chiefly witnessing to the atrocities of the world. Poetry must witness to the invisible, not the visible. The poet Lee Young Lee says, the poet shows how the invisible is more real than the visible, that the visible is merely a late outcome of an invisible reality that rules us in the way the subconscious rules us. Our dreamscape is larger and rules us more than our waking state. We're losing our bodies second by second. We can't hold on to anything. It's romantic to think we can. It's not our business to witness to any of this. No, the poet's business is to witness the spirit, the invisible, the law. That's all we unleash. A poem ultimately imparts silence. As it does that, as we feel that, we begin to be disillusioned. We're disillusioned of our ego's small presence in order to reveal the presence of the deeper silence, this pregnant, primal, ancient, contemporary, and imminent silence. Meditation is about silence and not. There's a misconception that the point of meditation is to get ourselves silent. Have you ever tried? It's impossible to get ourselves anything like that. The mind goes berserk when we sit quietly and do nothing, and we watch our minds be berserk. One sits and opens all the senses, sight, smell, touch, hearing, and thoughts. Thoughts are, are part of the senses, too. One pays attention. If the mind wanders into daydream, one just notices when it returns. What happens in this kind of open meditation is that we begin to actually experience our lives instead of experiencing what our stories tell us our lives are or should be. We begin to see our stories about ourselves as just stories about ourselves. As we pay attention, as we let things go on without adding to them or subtracting from them, the mind tends to quiet down on its own. We begin to experience the space between words between our ideas about things. We approach the often quite frightening space where we don't know anything. We don't know what's next. We don't know what meaning is here. We don't know what we should feel or think, but we feel and think anyway. This is our creative wellspring, the space some call God and some call peace. We're open, we're living beings. We see the content of our minds, but don't grasp at it as a fixed entity. When we begin to see this way, we are able to act with clarity and directness and genuineness based on what we actually see and feel, not based on our preconceptions or fixed ideas. We relate to people and nations as they are, not as what we imagine them to be. You can see how poetry and meditation are the same. 
They require a willingness to hold still. They notice the silence. They notice what's happening in and out of the silence. They're scary as hell. They bring us to the precipice of our prejudices. They ask us to dwell in what we don't know, to allow the self-protective boundaries of the ego that we've built up over the years to soften and dissolve so the real self, which is much larger and, as the poet Walt Whitman says, contain multitudes, can begin to function. Here's a poem by Jane Hirschfield. It's called Against Certainty. There is something out in the dark that wants to correct us. Each time I think this, it says that. Answers hard in the heart grammar's strictness. Then if I say that, it too is taken away. Between certainty and the real, an ancient enmity. When the cat waits in the path hedge, no cell of her body is not waiting. This is how she is able so completely to disappear. I would like to enter the silence portion as she does, to live amid the great vanishing as a cat must live, one shadow fully at ease inside another. Do we want to be a cat? No, but we want to live entirely inside our lives, to know and not know, like the cat, acting out of what's real and true and right in front of us. I lied. There is no saving ourselves or the world. We're all being spent minute by minute. The greatest act of generosity is to let go of the last minute so that this one can be here, so that we can see what best needs to be done, where our compassion must naturally flow now. Our hope is in giving up hope in our gadgets and our noise and our absolute certainties and see what really is the case at this moment. Thank you.